Hello, I'm Mary Crossley, professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, and I'm going to talk about the Supreme Court's June 25, 2015 decision in King v. Burwell and its implications for the success of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare or the ACA. I'll start by describing how this judicial challenge to Obamacare compares to the case decided by the Supreme Court three years ago and the key elements of Obamacare implicated by the current challenge. Then I'll explain the legal question that's specifically at issue in King and why the stakes for the court's decision were so high. I'll summarize how the court actually decided the case and then close with a few reflections on what the decision means for Obamacare going forward. King v. Burwell was not the first ex existential threat to Obamacare to make its way to the Supreme Court. Three years ago, the court decided NFIB v. Sebelius, where challengers argued, among other things, that Congress did not have the constitutional authority to enact the individual mandate requiring persons to buy health insurance. In a result that surprised many, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote for a bare majority of the court to uphold the constitutionality of the individual mandate. By contrast to the NFIB case, which required the justices to interpret the meaning of the Constitution, this term's case, King v. Burwell, required them to interpret the meaning of the Affordable Care Act itself. The court had to wrestle with what specific words in the statute that Congress passed mean. Compared to the task of constitutional interpretation, statutory interpretation is a relatively narrow exercise. But even though the task may have been narrow, the stakes were tremendously high in this case. So why were the stakes so high? Answering that requires a basic understanding of how the Affordable Care Act works. It's sometimes compared to a three-legged stool with three key parts. First, a set of insurance regulations require health insurers to issue policies to all purchasers without charging higher rates or denying coverage to people in poor health. Second, the ACA includes the individual mandate as well as an employer mandate so that almost everyone will have insurance. That way, healthy people will be covered along with sicker people, balancing out costs. Third, since health insurance is so expensive, more expensive than many people can afford, the ACA includes tax subsidies to help low and middle income Americans pay for the insurance that they're required to purchase. These three elements are mutually supportive and interdependent, just like the three legs of a stool, which means if one is removed, the stool will topple. And if the plaintiffs in King versus Burwell had succeeded, it would have broken the tax subsidies leg of the stool. So that gives some context to the, for King versus Burwell. The case itself is about the meaning of just a handful of words in a statute of over 900 pages. A provision of the ACA makes tax subsidies available for people who buy health insurance on the ex insurance exchanges established by the Act. You only get the subsidy if you buy your insurance on an exchange. In a section setting out the formula for calculating the amount of subsidies, the ACA refers to purchases made on an, quote, exchange established by the state, close quote. See, the ACA called for states to set up exchanges, but Congress can't make states set up exchanges, and 34 states chose not to. But the ACA also lets the federal government step in and run exchanges in states that choose not to, which it did in those 34 states. And in implementing the tax subsidies, the IRS made subsidies available to purchasers on both the exchanges that the states themselves set up and exchanges the federal government operated in states that didn't set up their own. The challengers and King argued that the IRS couldn't do that, that the plain meaning of the phrase in the statute referring to an exchange established by the state meant that subsidies could not be given to purchasers on a federally operated exchange. So the precise legal issue in King was the validity 
of the IRS's reading of the statute to provide subsidies to Americans in those 34 states that didn't set up their own exchanges. As the date for arguing the case before the court approached, and in the months before a decision was announced, we heard a great deal of discussion about what would happen if the Supreme Court struck down the subsidies to the seven plus million people who bought their health insurance on federal exchanges. The most obvious impact would be on those people, many of whom would no longer be able to afford health insurance and would lose their coverage. But beyond that immediate impact, a decision for the plaintiffs was also predicted to have a destabilizing effect on insurance markets in states where subsidies were no longer available. Health insurers would still have to sell to everyone, healthy or sick, but once insurance was less affordable, only people in worse health would be likely to buy insurance. When healthier people start to drop out of the insurance pool, premiums rise. When premiums rise, more healthy people drop out, and so on. This is the classic insurance death spiral that could ultimately lead to the collapse of individual insurance markets in the affected states. That's why this challenge threatened to render unworkable the ACA scheme for using private insurance markets to increase coverage while enacting insurance reform. A lot was on the line in the case. In its decision, a six-member majority of the Supreme Court upheld the validity of subsidies for purchasers, purchasers on federally operated exchanges. And as in the NFIB case from three years ago, Chief Justice John Roberts authored the majority opinion. In most cases, Chief, Chief Justice Roberts votes with the more conservative justices, but here he aligned with the liberals. That outcome isn't entirely surprising, however, precisely because questions of statutory interpretation tend to be less ideologically driven than questions of constitutional interpretation. While the justices may divide sharply, as they did in this case, the choice of one interpretive approach over another isn't inherently politically conservative or liberal. In interpreting the phrase, exchange established by the state, the majority opinion rejected a plain meaning approach that would look only to those five words for meaning. Instead, according to Chief Justice Roberts, the court should read those words in the context of the broader statutory scheme in which they appear. Preliminarily, the majority also said that it didn't think that Congress would have delegated to the IRS the tremendously important question of whether subsidies were available on federal exchanges, and that therefore it was the court's job to answer that question in the first instance. This point's important with respect to the long-term implications of this decision, which I'll touch on in a minute. The majority opinion did a deep dive into the ACA's complicated subsidy provisions and concluded that, given the entire statutory scheme, the phrase exchange established by the state was ambiguous. And having found the statutory language ambiguous, the majority looked to the statute structure and Congress's purpose in enacting the ACA to conclude that the legislation contemplates the availability of subsidies on federal exchanges. The opinion concluded, Congress passed the ACA to improve health insurance markets, not to destroy them. If at all possible, we must interpret the act in a way that is consistent with the former and avoids the latter. Not surprisingly, this prompted a strong dissent from Justice Scalia and two other justices. The dissent refused to find any ambiguity in the phrase exchange established by the state and accused the majority of engaging in interpretive sleight of hand so that it could save Obamacare. So what does King versus Burwell mean for Obamacare? First, it's important to recognize that this case did not establish any groundbreaking judicial precedent. In contrast to the NFIB decision from three years ago, which established new precedent on the scope of Congress's power under the Constitution, this case just decided what five words in a particular statute mean. That said, the practical implication for the viability of the ACA's healthcare reforms are immense. 
most immediately, the millions of Americans who have used Obamacare subsidies to buy insurance won't lose them. And the health insurance markets won't be thrown into a tailspin by the loss of he healthy subscribers. How the court decided the case has longer term implications. The court could have upheld the subsidies simply by following an established principle of administrative law known as the Chevron Doctrine, which says that if Congress has delegated responsibility for interpreting a statute to an administrative agency, courts should defer to that agency's interpretation of ambiguous statutory language. But as I noted above, the court said that Congress did not delegate interpretive authority on the question of subsidies to the IRS, but that instead the court should answer that question. That's important. If the court had simply deferred to the IRS's interpretation, then it would be possible that a future presidential administration might direct the IRS to change its interpretation, which it would be able to do. Instead, the majority's reasoning establishes the validity of federal subsidies, uh, subsidies on federal exchanges as Supreme Court precedent, which can be changed only by the Supreme Court overruling it or Congress amending the statute. Finally, the tenor of the majority opinion bodes well for the ACA's ongoing security from serious judicial challenges. Additional challenges to aspects of the Affordable Care Act and its implementation are still working their way through the federal courts, and more will likely be brought. But none of them threatens to broadly disable health care reform. Moreover, Chief Justice Roberts' authorship of the majority opinion, with its repeated invocation of congressional purpose, suggests that he is not likely to let judicial challenges undercut the reform's central aspects unless there are very clear legal grounds for doing so. The long-term success of Obamacare is still not a sure thing. Many bumps on the road likely remain in its implementation, but it now seems fairly clear that this Supreme Court is not going to undo the health care reform.